Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of The Lowdown. Today I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by German football expert Jonathan Harding for a deep dive on two of his publications, Mensch, which is a great story about German football coach and education, and his recent publication, Soul, which focuses on the, at the, play, the person even behind the athlete. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Connor, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about this work and to spend some time with you. Pleasure's all mine. Jonathan, you'd be delighted to hear anyway, so I've been reading this mensch for a third time <laughs> over the Thank past you. weekend, picking up on Golden Nuggets the whole time. Um, I suppose for anyone which hasn't heard of your work on mensch, could you care to enlighten them please on the origins of the story and perhaps what it's all about? Oof. Um, I think the origins are after the World Cup win in 2014 with Germany, I think there were a lot of questions asked about how Germany got to that point as a, as a footballing nation. Um, and Rafa Honigstein wrote that, that great book, Das Reboot. But I didn't think that anybody had written anything about the coaching aspect. Um, and we started to see in the years after that number of coaches coming from youth teams, making first teams in the Bundesliga. And now we've seen in recent years a number of coaches going from the Bundesliga to the Premier League. So I thought there was something else to explore there. Um, and I wanted to talk about German coaching. So that was kind of my initial thought. I spoke to a lot of people across the country who were involved in that. I was very grateful for some really helpful people who believed in the idea and helped me speak to others. I tried to make the book as much about what other people were saying um, as much as it was like a story of German coaching. But in the end, it ended up just being a revelation that basically the best coaches care about people and these the structures in which that works um, there were technical aspects of course I mean that's that's necessary and that was important but I just thought it was time to 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 give those voices and those people what I consider to be at the forefront of that development and the forefront of German coaching the opportunity to explain what makes them stand out what makes German coaching so exceptional so it was a lot of fun to put together and just very uh, grateful that it's been well received. And you can tell by the timeless principles they're still, still going three years later. But even there's one interesting element you mentioned there, and it was about caring for people. Um, I suppose the book, although it covers a broad range of coaches, coach educators and whatnot, you could call the Holy Trinity, the likes of your Jurgen Klopp's, Thomas Tuchel and Julian Nagelsmann. I mean, they've aged well since publication three years ago, haven't they? But yeah. if you could say there was even just one common denominator between all three of these guys, successful guys we may have, you could say that they're each a mention finger. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, excellent excellent pronunciation, yes. What's Absolutely, that yeah. Um, that is, yeah, that's probably the one word to take away from it. Yeah, mention finger is, is it's about catching people with the ideas that you have. It's not a word that translates, and that's why I, I use German language throughout the book, because sometimes and often the German language is very beautiful at explaining something succinctly. I think the idea of a Menschenfänger is best embodied by Jürgen Klopp. It's someone that you would, <clears throat> you, know, you hear this phrase with him a lot, run through walls for, but I think it's beyond that. I think it's the idea of if you were sitting down in a group of people, who is it amongst your friends that you would totally and utterly follow based on the way in which they spoke to you, the language they used, the empathy that they displayed. Um, I think that's what that is really all about. And I think modern coaching is more and more about that ability. How do you create an environment in which either you help the mention finger of the group or you, if you are that person, best lead? And I love the concept of someone being someone who sort of like collects people. I mean, that's what the essence of this expression is. Um, because you can really picture that concept in your mind in a way that other terms about leadership don't. I think we have overused other terms to the point where I think we've lost what the original meaning of things like actually the word leadership in itself is also now rather diluted by overuse. So I love this term because I think it works perfectly for what modern coaching is about. You know, who is it that is able to collect you and to bring you to a point where you are willing to go forward because of the way in which they've said something, they've spoken to you, they've connected to you. 
And I agree, all three of those coaches have displayed that, albeit in varying ways. Um, I think Jurgen Klopp is the most obvious one because he has outward displays of that emotion, which I think people can relate to. I think Thomas Tuchel has less of that outward display, but I think a lot of his players would say that, um, yes, he can be a very difficult person sometimes because he's a bit of a hard taskmaster, but I also think he understands how to work with people. I don't think he's cold um, at all. And yeah, Julian Nagelsmann and a lot has been said about him. I think for his age, he has a remarkable understanding of how to interact with other people. And that speaks to, to him, to his quality as a coach, but also to his understanding um, as, a, as a person, you know, he gets it. So I think it's a common trait for a lot of coaches, um, but I would also say that it doesn't have to be the way for all coaches. You know, I don't think there's one path. Not everyone needs to be Jurgen Klopp. But it's certainly something that I think is more relevant now in a modern era than uh, perhaps in previous years. Of course. And there's always one quote from Robert Greene's Mastery. Have you read that book before, Jonathan? I have not. No, I have not. I always revert back to um, its competence comes before comprehension. So the mm. ability for one to display competency always will come before their ability to describe that competency. And I think that's what we're speaking about now we're trying to get on to the point of because it's okay for me and you to be debating over social competency and whatnot, or even the late, or even the best coach and educators, which we'll touch upon the likes of your Frank Formans. But when it comes to Julian Nagelsmann himself, where he speaks about coaching being, what, 70% social competence? It's time for us then to set up and take notice. Yeah, definitely. And I think it, it speaks also to the fact that I think the head coach is the most important person in all of these situations. I think sometimes in football, we can get carried away with having too many peripheral figures. And that's not to say they don't have value or they don't add value. I think they do. But I think one thing I certainly feel from all the people I've spoken to is that the head coach needs to be the conduit for all of those ideas. Because for everyone who's ever played at any level, you all know that that connection with the head coach is the most important thing. Like you, you always hang on that word. You always want to be, be not impressed, but you know, you, you want that connection. And so to have maybe 15 other figures, you know, it can be a bit complicated. Who's, who's saying what, how do I listen to? Inevitably relationships will happen when you're at a football club or any sports team for that matter. And that's totally natural. But I think the head coach's ability to, recognize that and be the central force for it is definitely the most important thing. And as you say, when someone like Julian Nagelsmann can speak from personal experience and say, look, I can tell you definitively that most of my job is understanding how to work with people and not how to play 4-3-3, then, yeah, I think uh, it's probably wise to listen. And then you do have a section in your book where we, if we were to go beneath the soil or beneath the iceberg, if you will, people would treat the likes of your Nagelsmann's Tuchel's and Klopp's as isolated successes. And they would come to question, I suppose, what more for more refrain, how the actual help to the whole German culture and education structure. I mean, throughout your research, John, obviously you answered that question in detail, but you, could you enlighten us? Were you a bit surprised and shocked when you heard that from other coaches? Yes and no. I mean, I think, I think to a certain degree, coaching is a profession in which too much is asked, to be honest. I, I think there is a degree of expectation there that is unhealthy. You know, the sacrifice, the hours, uh, the commitment, the, the drag away from their own lives in many respects. I, I don't know whether, I mean, it is, it is somewhat shocking when you do hear coaches speak about that kind of level of sacrifice. but. There is also an element in a similar way to the top players in football of wanting to reach that level and understanding what is required to get there. I think the coaching course in Germany is in a pretty good state. I think there are lots of areas that they need to improve on. The, you know, if you look at the details, something like having 800 hours of learning, for example, is one of the things that people love to pull up and say, well, this is a phenomenal amount compared to other countries. But I think that's also because, as Frank said to me at the time, Frank Wollmer, who used to be um, head, the chief instructor at Germany's coaching academy, you know, if we're going to do something, we want to do it right. 
And, you know, Germany is in a privileged position. You know, they have the finances and the opportunity and the resources to be able to say that. You know, if you're the FA of Papua New Guinea or Lithuania, you don't have those options, right? So you, you stick to the minimum guidelines by um, your governing uh, body. And that's, that's that. And, that. and that's not to say that one is better than the other. But I think Germans definitely have had, there is a mindset to that, which is, we want to do it and we want to do it comprehensively. I think that that is also part of German culture to a certain degree. You know, there's a, a desire to be experts and to understand something to the absolute degree, which I think is commendable, but I think you can go too far. Um, I think there is a line and Frank said this as well. He, you know, he looks at the French team sometimes and the way that the French coach and he said, look, and I love this quote from him. He said, you know, they eat bread and they have a glass of wine and you know what? They're also fine and pretty good at football. So <laughs> There is probably a lesson somewhere there that too much is never a good thing, but obviously there is a certain level of commitment that you would you would hope for and that you'd expect at that kind of level. I don't, as I say, I don't think I was personally too shocked. I think later on in the work I did in Seoul, I was more surprised about what was being demanded and the cost and the price of coaching for some people, um, whether that be at the top level or not. That was something different from Mensch. Um, but I think in terms of Germany's coaching culture, uh, I think there are improvements that need to be made, absolutely. But on the whole, I think there's a reason that it's one of the most revered coaching courses in the world. But it's almost indicative and reflective of German society as well too, Jonathan. Um, you know, traditional old German values such as hard work, commitment to achieving excellence, rising from intern to partner within the same company. I mean, on one hand, we're speaking about this, the likes of your, again, I'll mention them, Klopp's, Tuchel's, Nagelsmann, starting with the U team, working their way up to the top. But then on the other hand, if you're looking at the 90% below and we have issues or we have cases of burnout. Are the two inseparable? Perhaps. Um, I think it's always easy to look at one or two examples and say the system is working. Um, I think inevitably you will have a lot of coaches who don't make it. And I think the reality is that it's easy to say, well, we have three or four or five and therefore everything's going great. Um, but by the nature of, uh, of the game, as it were, you know, not everyone can be that person based on their own characteristics and their own development and their own, their own context, their own culture that brought them to that point. Not everybody can be what's required to be at the top level. But that doesn't mean you should have a system that demands too much of individuals. I think, you know, we talked about burnout with Ralph Ranić years ago. I mean, he had that situation when he was at, um, at Schalke. So I, I think those concerns have been around for a while. Uh, I think they have tried to make changes recently where, you know, they're not trying to offer the Fußballera, which is the top, the pro license to as many people in an attempt to reduce the number of like overqualified coaches for the top job. You know, you only need that for the top three divisions in Germany. So how many more coaches are you going to have than jobs available? You don't want to be, have too many people who are overqualified and then can't get the job anywhere. Um, because, all, you know, you, then you'll have a massive pool of people who, as you've just said, have sacrificed so much to get to a certain point and don't even get the chance to interview or, you know, have a chance at the job. I think, unfortunately, you're probably right to say that or to question at least whether they are inseparable to a certain degree. Whether it's possible to separate them in the future is another question entirely. I think with the current system in place, it's probably not. But I think we have to ask bigger questions. You know, what is it that we want coaches to achieve? What, how far do we want people to go in their pursuit of excellence? Is it healthy to demand this? Is, you know burning out their physical and mental health to a certain degree, part of the sacrifice we expect people to make. I personally don't think that that's a healthy approach. I think there's a decent level of commitment that you can ask someone to make or to, to give. Um, but it doesn't ever have to get to a point where someone's burnt out or mentally fatigued as a result of that. I think that's something that not just German coaches and the coaching system and structure here has to look at, but all coaches and all countries that are trying to be at the forefront of coaching have to observe. I, I see that as a big problem going forward as the game becomes more and more professionalized. We reach an end to this stage of hyper-professionalization. 
where children are being scouted from a younger age coaches are under pressure to reach higher levels sooner so you know if you haven't got a first team experience by the time you're 30 you're almost out you know and what have you had to do to get that you know i i think that's an extremely unhealthy road to be going down and i think we uh, you know the sport generally um, needs to ask bigger questions you know, is it worth it is is this the cost that we're willing to pay um if we're just to revert back to German culture and education briefly before we touch on Seoul, Jonathan, the one thing I would have to describe it from the outside, their German football ecosystem, I would have to call it very regimented, very structured. And if I'm being, being very honest with you, I did not know that there was people that existed, such as Matthias Lochmann and Fininho, Hurst Vine, uh, Helmut Gruss, Ralf Ragnick, Zayed at Red Bull Leipzig. I did not know that these people existed until reading Mensch. And what was fascinating was you could look subjectively or objectively even at these guys' accomplishments, all they've, they've done in a game, the players they've worked with, um, the youth development programs they've implemented, etc. But you will still have a vast majority of people pointing the finger at them and saying, no, you're stepping out of society. Is that the case in Germany? I'm just intrigued as to how these guys are seen. Even Helmut Bruce, 75, 76 years of age now. I think he's in he's back in football now, isn't he? But Ragnick at Man United, even. Yeah, I mean that connection, that relationship, I think, will always be there. I think there is no rough running without Helmut Gross. So that also means that there is no modern coaching tree in Germany without Ralph Ranick. So you're in many ways, you're talking to one of the original pioneers. It was an absolute honor to be in his presence and to chat to him about football for so long but yeah i mean it's it's a valid question i personally i think it's a reflection of the nature of german society in many ways it is not a flexible space um often whether that be you know academia or um in professional sports it's the same i think there are certain paths and expectations that, uh, that are supposed to be filled and there are clear paths and that's the way that things work at least that's my experience and i think that can be a problem and it is proven to be a problem for german coaching german coaching and german football generally because if you stay in the same lane and you stay fairly rigid then you don't have flexibility which means innovation is harder to come by and i think innovation is also something that germany needs to needs to look to other fields. If you think about the fact that one of the vaccines for COVID-19 came from Germany, that's exciting because there is an element of innovation and, and forefront thinking and science. We need to see more of that in coaching. And I don't think there's always space for that. You know, these people sometimes work in the background, absolutely. And they don't, I think some of them prefer to work in the background, don't, don't like to be well-known or be in the foreground. And I think that's their choice. But I think Matthias Lochmann is a perfect example for someone who is battling against structures that are resistant to change or to adaptation or to modernization. Um, and that, that is tough. You know, he has a fantastic idea built on evidence that he has collated over years of work that shows that this is what's required at the moment, specifically to generate the type of players that Germany is looking for. And yet he's still coming up against opposition um at the state level often rather than from the dfb because they have adopted some of his ideas but at the state level to people who will say well we've always coached this way what's what's the problem with that um or you know we can't there's no need to reinvent football or why should people come and watch a different play a different game to the one they watch on television so there i think there's always going to be opposition when you offer change and you offer something different but i think history, particularly in football, will show that often that can lead to greater success because you can't just keep doing the same that everybody else is doing if you wish to be successful. I mean, that is ultimately the definition of how many champions have been created. They chose to do something differently and they were innovative in their field or in their approach. I, I think Germany needs to do more of that and um, I hope they do in, in the future. I think you only have to look at the diversity of the player pool for starters, um, you look at what the likes of England, France, even Spain now, Portugal in recent years have been able to harness in the world stage in terms of all these different talents merging together. But you look in Germany, for me, it's just been isolated cases over the years, the likes of your flying verses, 
Kai Havertz, Leroy Sanez, granted Kareem, Eddie Amy and a few others now. But it's been a long time coming. And I think what Lachman is proposing, what Horst Fine did originally with Fanino, is just giving it back to the players, giving them ownership of their game, moving away from a coach-centric structure, which I think, although German coaching education for me is great, it's idealistic, but when you're championing something underneath the fact of here's 800 hours, you're a football layer. I know there's much more to it than that, but for me, it just takes away the creativity, the intelligence, and the social competence part, which we spoke about earlier on, about actually, can you get underneath a player's skin? Not only that, can you get underneath 23 players' skins from different nationalities, different cultures, different backgrounds, and get them performing together under one roof? Which I have to say, as a Chelsea fan, I'm still fairly impressed Thomas Tuchel manages to do on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people are impressed um, with, with Thomas Tuchel's work. But... Uh, yeah, I, I can see that side of things that I, I think you're right to say that there is more to it than that, because I think there is certainly an element of the course, both when Frank was the chief instructor and now with Daniel Nikovsky being the chief instructor, that does consider this personal aspect. And I think Daniel has done his best to update the coaching course as it is and definitely make sure that there's a greater awareness for that. I think they've realized as well, particularly through the pandemic, that this is more important than ever, this need for a connection on a non-footballing basis. So I think they're doing their best to stay ahead of that. But I think you're never going to escape some level of stereotype if you are still approaching it with this 800 hours, as you say, you know, somewhat academic approach, classroom level, right? But that, on the other hand, is also what gives them the foundation of knowledge to be able to succeed on a technical or a tactical level. I think it's always a question of finding the right balance. And of course, ultimately, it's up to the individual, you know, Frank always talks about that, and I think this is so true. He's not there to change personalities. He's also not there to mold people into something that they're not. He is there to provide them with all the information, and then it's up to the individual. So you give people the best opportunity to make a success of themselves, but they also have to make choices for themselves that put them in the right spot to learn more about how to, as you say, get under the skin and to connect on a personal basis. Um, I think that's something that you can uh, teach to a certain degree, but only somewhat. Um, and I think it's hard to do in a coaching course environment because there's so many technical aspects that need to be included for you to reach a certain level. And we can have a conversation about whether that's something that needs to change because I think the approach to coaching qualifications is also a bit like um, educational qualifications. Have you got a master's? Have you got a PhD? This is now a prerequisite for any job. If you don't, it's like, oh, everyone else in the room does, so why don't you? So then you have to ask questions about well, if everyone has one, you know, where's the innovation coming from and have we lost the true value of it? I mean, that's another question, but yeah, I think, I think there's probably a little bit of rigidity, rigidity to it, or rigidness to it, but I think they are trying to be more flexible. And I think ironically, in some ways, the, the pandemic has forced them to be more flexible about their approach to how they, they coach, um, how they instruct coaches. But I, I think you can go too far in the other direction as well. You know, I said this earlier, but I think the danger is that we all look at Jurgen Klopp and say that's how coaches should be. You know, everybody has that personality. You know, everybody's outgoing. Not everybody is going to run up and down the, the, the touchline, you know, thumping their chest and, and doing that because not everybody's that type of person. And it's not to say that it's, you know, right or wrong. You, you have to coach the way that you are, which is what Daniel was saying. Um, and I think that's very true. You have to coach you the way you are, and that has to be appropriate and um, applicable to the team and to the organization that you're in and to the culture that you wish to build and to recognize the culture that you're in. Because it's all very good being who you are in an environment, and that's great for you, but if it doesn't fit with everything else, then that's also a concern. It's going to hinder your chances of success. So yeah, I do think there are, are some areas that, as I say, that, that can be improved, but I, I think it's important that it's not just, it's not, I think it's the coaching course is not just this academic, very thorough approach. Um, it's there and it's, it's, it's definitely um, relevant, but I don't think it's, I think it's much more than that as well. Um, could it be better? Could there be more included? Yes. But at the end of the day, as I say, they're not there to mold characters per se, you know, that, that's something that could be done. 
Um, but it's the coaching course in itself is is designed for something different. Very interesting. I think it's actually the perfect segue into Soul, which is your new publication, of course. Very interesting read and on a very prominent topic on player welfare. One assumption I have about Soul, Jonathan, you may correct me if I'm wrong here. Having read Minch, I got the sense you were scratching an itch. But I think with Minch, you went a little bit too deep and you started to realise you didn't have <laughs> all the pages in a book to put down all the information you wished. Am I correct? To a certain degree. I think I came away from Mensch thinking, okay, you know what? Um, this has been really fun to make and I'm going to take a break because writing a book is quite exhausting. But the one question that stuck with me was, every coach here has told me that the essence of coaching is to care about people. So does professional sport care about people? And I couldn't get away from thinking, no. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to find out. And I tried to find people who were at the coalface, fighting against structures, believed in a holistic approach, um, and wanted to find out whether it was possible to, to do that more, basically. Um, yeah, I think there was certainly an element of still having questions unanswered, but I think in many ways, Mensch, I sort of drew a line under Mensch because that was very German focused, you know? So I, I felt like that part of it had been done, but it, in a way, writing that book definitely opened me up to the idea of the second one, for sure. Because I came across it on actually the very first page of Mensch in the introduction. Oh, you right. Said you wanted to start a conversation about human values in a field which is losing touch with humanity. And for me, I think that's beyond the German borders, so to speak. Yes, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a running indictment of the state of football, not only football, but as you alluded to earlier on, the sports industry. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that's a, it's a funny thing that I wrote that in the book before. You're right. Um, I think that's probably also true of Seoul. I think it is. And that's not to say that there aren't people who aren't doing good work. As I say, you know, I was fortunate to speak to some of them. But I do also think that we have reached a point, as I mentioned earlier, of hyper-professionalization in many sports, particularly football, where results are all that matters. Players are assets. Uh, coaches are on a strict timeline to deliver wins. And almost everything is boiled down to analytics. Now, I don't want to be the person that sits here and says analytics are bad. We shouldn't use them. We absolutely should. They're very useful. They can literally provide evidence to support a case. And I think in many ways, we've, we've advanced sport greatly by moving away from the idea of I can feel it in my bones who's going to be great or I just know because that wasn't founded in evidence, I think, that really helped us move forward. However, I would say in the personal development aspect, when you're talking about personality or you're talking about character, you're talking about individuals, not from a performance perspective, I think it's deeply difficult to start moving into analytics and say, this is a measurement out of 100 that measures this person based on this, or you know, their character is a 72. I, I think you start to get into a very difficult field of justification for that kind of work, because one, that seems to me a largely objective way of, of marking someone as a human, and two, that's not really what this is about. You know, I think we, start, we need to start looking at individuals and realizing what is it that's brought them to this point? Who are they? What culture have they grown up in? And can we not take them out of that and remove them and make them more of a professional individual in this setting? But can we, can we involve them in their own cultural understanding that allows them to develop? So this sounds like, I'm using lots of $15 words to explain something, but actually what I mean is, you know, if you're taking someone out of a situation and you're moving them from one country to another and suddenly you're expecting them to perform at the same level, have you considered beyond performance, maybe that they're missing their local food? Have you considered maybe they're missing speaking the language that they like to speak, their friends being around? Maybe just also the, the environment is different for them. Have they got a good support base? What is it that they like to do outside of football? Do they like to read? You know, and if you think about this and extrapolate it to academy players, can you start to look in ways in which you want to develop individuals outside of performance? Because again, 
we, you know, seen the statistics over and over again. Not most of academy players, in professional football particularly, don't go on to be professionals at the top level or anywhere for that matter. But if you've got, you know, a team of 16, 17 year olds, can you spot the people who are creative? And are there links there to music or art? Are there ways to generate pathways in which you're celebrating the successes of individuals that were in your organization, even if they don't end up playing in your organization? I think these are the kind of things that need to change or need to happen more often. I think there are good people out there doing it. One of my favorite is the Right to Dream group, Nord Seeland in Denmark. Um, you know, Tom Vernon's doing a fantastic job with his focus on character development. I, I love that focus. They, they celebrate all of the people that they work with and they have a number of graduates who go to US colleges. I think that kind of stuff is really important because it basically comes back to the, the idea and understanding of what is it that we want clubs to do? We want clubs, sporting organizations to represent a community. So why do I support a team? So I born outside Brighton. Why do I support Brighton? Okay, because I was born outside there. There's a connection for me. I think we've reached a point now where we have to ask ourselves if you support a team, do you just support them to win or lose? You know what? And if you can answer that question, I just support them because I want them to win, then that's fine. You know, I'm not going to tell you why you support a team. For me personally, I want to support a team because, yes, I want them to win, obviously, but mainly because there's a connection there that runs deeper than winning or losing. And often that connection is tied to the values of which that organization represents. Now, often these values are banded about like they don't really mean anything and everyone wants to talk about respect and determination and all of this stuff. And that's valued and it's important. But what is it that they do with their actions that tell you that they are actually involved in those kind of values? So when I think about the work that Brighton does inside its community, when I think about the people who are involved in that organization, yes, it's still a performance-based approach. They're a professional Premier League team. I would expect nothing else. But there does seem to be a deep level of consideration there. You could say the same about Norwich as well, for example, where there's something else happening there. And those kind of values, I think, are probably the kind of things that are going to last longer because if we're honest, if we're in it for winning or losing, eventually you're going to win, eventually you're going to lose, right? Whatever it is, I'm not talking about the Champions League or whatever, but, you know, win a game, win a cup, go on a run, whatever it is. It'd just be one Saturday for all I care. I think there has to be something deeper there. And I think there, are, there is something deeper there for a lot of people. And so to bring it back around, if the reason that people care about sports organizations is based on something more than winning or losing, then we have to make sure that the people inside those organizations are developed beyond winning and losing as well. So again, you know, I, I think that's something that sports organizations and teams really needs to do more of in the future. We've seen it in the last year in the pandemic as well. A number of individuals who've spoken up. You know, the Black Lives Matter movement definitely resonated in a way with a modern athlete. And I think that's also something that's very relevant. So multiple waves in which the athlete and many modern athletes have had their voice awoken as it were or realized that they have a platform to to instill great social change but also to ask themselves deeper questions who am i what do i stand for why am i playing for this organization yes i want to win but what else do i want to achieve with my life what else do i stand for you know I, that kind of stuff needs to be nurtured more by organizations can they do it in a relevant and applicable way for them in their community i'd love to see more of it i think it's important to reiterate that there is always room and there's always a necessity for storytelling but embedded in reality only one team can win the world cup only one player can win the ballon d'or where i'm going with this is that just before we begun this podcast we spoke off camera about a 13 16 year old Bayern munich paul vanner and it's almost insidious and it's almost <laughs> It's weird. We were speaking about, oh, how he is such a great support network. How, you know, as if it's the exception to the rule. When we can just say, how unfortunate is Yusuf Mukuku at Borussia Dortmund compared to him? Where you look at this guy who had the world at his feet at the age of 14, 15, signed a million euro uh, contract with Nike, made his first team debut with Borussia Dortmund, eight months into his professional career, all already citing claims of burnout. I mean, what hope has the sport had? What hope do we have in the sport at all? It, it, it's it's ludicrous, really. Yeah, it is, and I think it's alarming. And I think it. I think the biggest problem is that when you start to see stuff like that, the my biggest concern is that the worst part of things like that is that there will just be another player. So, 
you know, I think too often sport or football or organizations or clubs will just say, that's terrible. We need to do better. But there are, guess what? There are 10,000 other players who will jump at the chance to not burn out or whatever, you know, and that's obviously not his fault, but that's, I think, the way the narrative is often framed. And my concern extends from that all the way down to, you know, kids who are being scouted at nine or six. I think it's a deeply worrying trend. What are we trying to do to professionalize children to that stage? I think it's scary. I think it's unhealthy. I think it's damaging. You're manipulating parents in that environment. You're manipulating children. You're taking them out of their childhood, putting them into a professional setting, that putting them on a career path at the age of seven or eight. You think about that. I was happy just being eight, running around outside. I didn't know what was going on. And I think that's the way that it should be. You know, the kids should have the opportunity to play as many sports as possible. Uh, they should be around their friends for as long as possible. And I think they should have as much autonomy as possible. Um, because if you start to manipulate that environment too much, you start to disregard the cultural understanding of the individual, but you also start to disregard everything that has to do with being a kid. And I think there are enough examples that show, I think the healthier way to go is to play lots of sports, to be around your friends. And when you get to 15, 16, 17, you can start to make stronger decisions for which one you have a preference for, but then you make them. You're not under pressure to make them, you know, and you have good support networks like, like Paul Banner, for example. But even then, you know, you need luck. Luck is a huge factor in all of this. You need to not get injured. You need the right people to be on your side. You need the right people to scout you or believe in you. A lot of that's subjective as well. So, yeah, I mean, it is going in a dangerous direction. I think there are people out there who are doing their best to change that, to fight against it. And I think in the future, we'll start to see more people in player welfare, more people in player care, more people in player well-being who are invested in making sure that burnouts don't happen, that the organizational values are transferred into day-to-day -day interactions. I think that's very, very important. You can't just have the word respect and determination on the wall. You actually have to embody that in the way that you are as an individual. Um, and you have to find out what truly makes you unique. You know, I visited a couple of sports teams in London before the pandemic. And I keep see I kept seeing words on the wall. I was like, well, this is this is great. Who, who comes up with these? And of course, they are very similar in every sports team. And I couldn't help but ask, I'm like, do you think this is what sets you apart? Do you not think every other sports team has this on their wall? You know, what is it that sets you apart? Find that. Find the thing that no one else has. Because that's what you really are. Yes, you want those values. You want values like respect and determination and commitment. Absolutely. But that's, that's the base level. You want that to be involved in all of your interactions and all of your activities. Absolutely. But is that what sets you apart? Is that what brings you together? Is that what makes you unique as a group? You want people to look at the stuff on the wall and be like, yeah, that's who we are. That's an identity. And that goes beyond the level of expectation that you have that involves things like respect. So I think there are people out there who are doing that work and I, I commend them. I, you know, I, I, I applaud their work. I hope that they get greater recognition. And I think in the future, we will see, as I say, more people involved in that kind of space because I think ultimately organizations and clubs are reaching a point where I think the smart ones, at least <laughs> they know they can't just keep exploiting people. They just can't. I mean, but, yeah. but you see, if you mind me interrupting Jonathan, it's really intriguing because what I'm starting to see now is a growing, tr another trend is that when you see people in clubs put these banners, these slogans all over the walls, you can't mm. see the wall. And of course, yeah, they're not, how could you live up to all of that? But then when you have clubs and organizations nowadays trying to mimic others by playing for the long term, but mm. they're not really, they just, they're posturing. It's virtue yeah. signaling. Yeah, no, I mean, that is also a problem. I think this area, personal development, character development, well-being, is unfortunately, and this is the danger, going to be seen as a box-checking activity for many organizations. Oh, we've done it twice a year. We've had a, we've had a guest speaker. We, we've, we've ticked the well-being box. It's fine. And I think that's a mistake, obviously. I, I don't think you achieve any of the deeper meaning and the real value of this kind of work if you don't embed it in the philosophy of your organization. And anyone who decides to go the different route isn't doing it properly. 
But I think if you're a young person who is looking to get in professional sport, if you're a coach and you believe in these things, then I think you have to make smart choices about what kind of organization you join. And that's easy for me to say, because I also appreciate that for coaches, it's incredibly difficult to get jobs. And sometimes you just have to take a job because it's the first one you've actually had the opportunity to have in months or years, and you've had to slave away at getting the chance. But, you know, I've spoken to coaches who've said that they've left organizations because they felt that part of them wasn't considered, that the expectation was too high, that there was not enough consideration for their own well-being. And if organizations don't wake up from that, which, as we've said, they may well not, because there are probably 10,000 other people who will take that job or become the next striker, then that's on them. But I think in the next 10, 15 years, those organizations will start to stand out as being the ones that didn't make the change. At least I choose to believe this, because if not, I might despair. So <laughs> I, I want to believe that in the next few years, based on everything that's happened in the last few years, an increased in athlete awareness about their own ability and understanding in the world and the, the kind of impact they can make, um, the increase in awareness of how athletes and players are also people primarily, and they are not machines that can just be burnt into the ground. These kind of things make me hopeful with the combination of the fact that there are already people out there in the field doing this work for organizations, that in the future, change will come and that players and coaches will want to be a part of, and fans will want to be a part of teams that, that value this stuff, um, that care for the person. And I choose to believe that that's something that the smartest organizations will do in the future Sports clubs are businesses. There will always be a business aspect. There will always be a bottom line that has to be made. I totally understand that. But even in business, you have to work with people. And if you look after the individual and you care for them and you give them an environment in which they feel considered and valued, do you really think they're not going to give you more in the end, ironically, performance-wise, than if you don't? And that's the greatest thing about all of this. And I wish that... That's part of the reason I wrote Soul is that one, I wanted to give people these, these people the platform and the voice that you know they need to be heard, but also because people in organizations who have the power to make these decisions, listen to it, see the value in it. Because if you are all about performance, then that's fine. Because you know what? In the end, this will lead to better performance. And that's the greatest irony of all. If you look after people, and you consider them, and you cultivate an environment in which their character is nurtured, do you really think that that's not going to lead to a performance increase? Of course it will. And then everybody wins. Because you've got an organization that cares about the person, that looks after their family, that looks after who they are outside of football, that plans for a life after football before it even comes into consideration so they don't retire and suddenly think, oh my God, who am I? There's a consideration for all of that. <laughs> If you do all of those things, you will get a performance increase. Because just like you or I, if we, had, if we were in an opportunity, in an, an environment, as an employee of whatever we were doing, and obviously you're a coach, if I was a coach, if I was a player, but it doesn't even matter. If I work for someone who I think, no, I don't think, I know they care about me. They care about who I am. They, they ask me questions. They look into developing me as a person. They give me opportunities to develop as a professional. They understand the flexibility of my life and the need for me to be around my family or whatever it is. And I'm still giving them what they need. Who's losing in this situation? Everybody's winning. Everybody's in a better place. Nobody's burning out. And the organization can only benefit from that, not, in a, not only on a performance basis, but in 15 years, if a player leaves a club, they'll say, yeah, no, I really enjoy playing for them because you know what? They also cared about me as a person. And there is no greater compliment than that i think from a sporting individual because if one person leaves and says hey i played for 15 years for this club we won all these titles and it was fantastic but you know what the best part of it was i had such a great relationship with all the guys in the huddle and they cared about me and my family the entire time and maybe if you're paired with an organization that doesn't want to win together it's time to get out <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, perhaps it is. But I, as I said earlier, it's, it's easier said than done. I totally appreciate coaches are in a hard spot. And I've spoken to a lot of them who, who feel this way. 
want to do more of this work, want to understand it more and taking steps to do so, but it's a tough world. I, I get it. You've got to take a job that you can have. Well, this does not only ring true at academy level, which we initially discussed, it also rings true at first team level with managers. Because, I mean, what we've come to know now in recent years, Dave Redden, who was on the podcast uh, last October, he spoke about the fact that there's not such thing as a unicorn coach, a coach mm. that does it all. However, what I'm starting to notice is that clubs, institutions, organizations are using this as an excuse to negate a prudent and a diligent recruitment process, which if I'm looking at the Bundesliga this season, I think you know what I'm getting at here, John. Red Bull Leipzig, Eintracht Frankfurt, Wolfsburg, and one or two other clubs, they've all failed in their managerial recruitment. Hmm. So what's the thinking? What's the logic? <laughs> well, it's a surprise. I think there have been some, some really interesting appointments. And as you say, most of them have failed. I think the thing about clubs like, well, I mean, there's no club like Leipzig. Leipzig. Leipzig benefit from having like a business approach because they're not really a football club. So that business approach does actually help them normally make the smart appointments. I think they fell for the idea of Jesse Marsh I don't think they, because he was also in the Red Bull family, and I think it's easier to think that that means it will be a natural fit. Maybe a disregard for how he would have worked as an individual, as a person. Um, certainly seems like that was something that didn't quite stick. Why do clubs make these decisions and make such wrong decisions? I think it was, yeah, it was alarmed. But if you look at Frankfurt, for example, they went from being a fairly wild team, got a coach that was a very stable coach, wanted something more solid, has worked in parts, fading off a little bit. So I think sometimes it takes a bit of transition, especially if you're working with a largely similar group of players. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not been a good year for decision-making in Germany uh, when it comes to managers. I have been surprised by that. Um, and I, I think there are bigger questions that need to be asked. And you can go back to all of the things we've talked about. These organizations, you know, Leipzig have fantastic facilities and, and have a history of, of approaching it a certain way, but they're also struggling now because they basically lost the, the man who created them in, in Ralph Ranić and who brought them into the modern era in Nagelsmann. So how do you move forward if everything that you are as, a, as an identity has now been ripped away? That's difficult. You have to basically rebuild who you are. I think they're trying with Tedesco, but I don't know whether that's going to work in the long term. Maybe it will. He's a coach who basically made a career out of playing largely defensive, unattractive football with Schalke and finish second. Maybe in this Leipzig team, that's the best combination. You don't know, right? Um, I think that's their thinking. I think a lot of these clubs have made those decisions trying to balance out maybe one too much of an extreme. Leipzig too much pressing here, we'll bring it back. Frankfurt were too wild all over the place, try and bring it back. Wolfsburg were too solid, maybe we want to bury things up a bit. Um, Gladbach are the same. You know, they went from Marco Rosa. We're going to one area. We're going to get a similar coach in Adi Hutu, who's just really capable of working well with a fairly wild team. Gladbach also a bit wild. Could work. Hasn't worked very well at all. Is that down to tactical approach? Is that down to Marco, uh, to Adi Hutu as a person? I don't know. But these are also things that you would think would come up in the interview process because it seems to me that... Um, you have to ask those questions. You have to seek a better fit. Of course, there are going to be times when you appoint someone and it doesn't work out. But for so many clubs to have made the wrong decision does, to me, smack of just very not thorough interview processes. And since you authored Mensch Jonathan nearly over three years ago at the stage, have there been any other add-ons or further considerations when looking at what do you believe the future coach should be? Ooh. I think one of the other things is that the future coach or a future coach, I mean, we it, it does come up a bit in Mensch, but this consideration of how to manage a staff and also, you know, you talked about not having, not, there not being a unicorn coach. I do definitely believe in that idea. But I think you need to make sure that, that you have the person who is going to lead, so the Mensch finger of the group, and then have everyone else around you who is also a part of that process, but maybe doesn't want to be the number one, because that can also lead to problems if you have too many very ambitious people in a small environment. Um, 
but I think the managing of a staff is really not to be underrated and you need you need the right people around you I think in recent years I've started to appreciate coaches need to have the right people around them but also recognize that they are the one person probably to transmit all the ideas in many respects um that's not to say that your analyst isn't going to talk to players and physios obviously got their work to do and you're going to have lots of people involved obviously that's natural but i think if you can reduce too many contact points to players i think that's a that's a good thing personally because i think um the head coach is such a fundamental part of a coaching unit uh, and a, a player's seek that contact from them in a way they might not from others like i say i think the relationship between players and other members of the coaching staff is very important and should be cultivated i'm not saying the coach should have some sort of monopoly on relationships or should be the only one leading but i think the way in which the key messages um, and the direction of of the culture that you wish to um, cultivate should come from them you know i think because it's, you know, they're the one leading the group. They're, they're the accountable master, if you like, for all of the actions that go on. Um, they're, the, they're your, your protector, they're your instructor. I always talk about coaches being like fathers. I think there's an inevitability to that relationship if it's done the right way. So I think that's something else I've appreciated. I always used to think the coaches should have a coach. There should be people who just coach young players and then just coach for the weekend because I think there's too much expectation around the head coach. But I think with a good staff, the head coach can probably do anything and they should be put in a position to, um, to be the sole voice going forward. And finally, to close, Jonathan, 2022 World Cup year, the Winter World Cup, as it may seem strange to add. What can we expect to see from Germany? Oh, good question. Well, I personally think they're going to win the World Cup. Um, Hansi Flick, for me, has shown that in time, in a time pressured situation with some of the best players in the world, nothing he can't do. Obviously, won six trophies of Bayern in one city. The way in which he had that team playing was phenomenal in such a short period of time, and he got the turnaround there. The spine of this Germany team is largely from Bayern, so I think that helps him. I think the cobwebs of the Love years have been shrugged off many people talk about the lack of a striker Germany has suffered from not having a Lewandowski or a Hall. I think that's a problem but not one that should hold them back I think they have enough quality in other areas to see them through so I'm expecting I'm expecting some really good performances um, I, I think there's a real sense I don't know what Flick wants to do in the future, but I think now it's become clear in recent years that he was one of the main reasons for the win in 2014, perhaps more than people gave him credit for at the time. But there's a real sense that this is in many ways the ending of another era after this World Cup. I mean, Neuer's probably going to go. You're going to have a, a couple of players. Johnny Cross has already retired. But you've got the Euros in Germany after that. So there is a big feeling that the next two years will probably be in many respects the last in which Germany can claw or hold on to this the last bits of a golden generation as it were and so I think there's real desperation there to be in the fight um, and not to waste it like they did last summer as Brighton's Adam Webster had heads in a last minute winner in the final against Germany in Doha I don't think he'll be too disconsolate with your prediction <laughs> I I I'm not sure. I mean, it's funny. I think England have the same, have a different situation. I think, ironically, England are where Germany probably were going into the 2014 World Cup. And the only difference, you know, Germany lost the semifinals of the 2012 Euros and that was a competition they should have won. You can make the argument that England should have just won those Euros. Um, and so there was, there's probably some similarities here, but the only difference is that England is on the verge of this great era of young players and they really want to capitalize on that with a tournament victory. Whereas Germany now 
are going into this tournament thinking this is probably one of our last chances. We've got a home tournament in two years. This is it. We've got to really capitalize on this group of players. So England Germany final, yeah, wouldn't wouldn't put it past it being you know beyond the realms of possibility. Great final for an Irishman. <laughs> 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 John, um, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Uh, what I'll do in the show notes below, I'll link both of your books, Mench and Soul, so everybody can go take a look. For anybody that wants to keep up to date with John, give him a follow on Twitter. I'll link in the show notes below also and keep up to date with his musings on the athletic. Jonathan, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Hopefully to see you again soon in the future. Thank you, Conor. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, really appreciate it.